Number three, Mitchell Sims. In March 1985, 24-year-old Mitchell Sims was having a problem with his boss at work. Sims was a manager at Domino's Pizza in West Columbia, South Carolina, and he claimed that his boss withheld some of his bonus. In revenge, Sims hatched a plan to get his boss fired. First, he would get all the other employees to quit with him. He was also going to send a letter to the head office, complaining about the supervisor. He thought that when they found out that all the employees quit, they'd have to fire the supervisor and rehire everyone who quit. The first problem that Sims encountered was that only one other person quit when he did. The other person was his girlfriend, who started working at the pizzeria a month earlier. Sims was furious about the incident, and he talked about killing his former boss and blowing up the store. He even bought a gun but he didn't end up going after his boss or his former co-workers. Instead, he got a job as a delivery man for another Domino's in Hanahan, South Carolina. Over the years, Sims stewed about the incident at the last door. His hatred for Domino's also grew, and he vowed to get revenge for being slighted. On December 3, 1985, 10 months after quitting his job at the Domino's in West Columbia, Sims went to the Domino's where he currently worked, armed with a 25 caliber handgun. Inside the store, he found Gary Melke and Christopher Zare working. Both were enlisted in the Navy, and they were both 24. Sims gathered up as much money as he could, and then he forced the men to get on their knees. He fired one bullet into Zare's head, and he shot Melke four times in the head. Sims then drove home and went to sleep. Amazingly, Melky wasn't dead. He managed to get into his car and drove half a mile to the police station and then proceeded to crawl to the front desk. The police rushed to the pizza parlor, but they were too late to save Zare. In the hospital, Melky told the police that Sims was the shooter. The police went to arrest Sims at his home, but he was gone. Melky survived for five days in the hospital, but then he had a heart attack, and he died. By that point, Sims was long gone. He and his girlfriend, 21-year-old Ruby Paget, had fled to the other side of the country, and they were holed up in a motel in Glendale, California. Exactly a week after the double murder, Sims called a local Domino's and asked for a pizza to be delivered to the motel room. A brief time later, 21-year-old John Harrington knocked on the door of their motel room. The couple let him in the room and then forced him to get on the floor. They got his shirt off, gagged him with a washcloth, and put a pillowcase over his head. Then they hogtied him so that the rope wrapped around his neck. Sims considered shooting him, but he didn't want the noise to attract any attention. Instead, they put him in the bathtub that was full of water while he was still tied up. As he struggled underwater, the rope pulled tighter around his neck and strangled him as he was drowning. After Harrington was dead, Sims put on his employee shirt and then he and Paget drove to the restaurant in Harrington's truck. At the store, they found two employees, Corey Spiroff and Edmund Seacam. Sims forced Spiroff to open the safe, and then Sims took $2,000. When a customer came in, Sims and Spiroff went to help him. It turned out that the customer was an off-duty employee. He noticed that Spiroff was acting odd, and he didn't recognize Sims, but assumed he was from another store. Then he noticed that Sims was smoking a cigarette in the store, which was against company policy. Also, his name tag said John, but when he answered the phone, he said, Domino's Pizza, Mitch, can I help you? After the off-duty employee left, Sims and Paget tied up Spiroff and Seacam's hands behind their backs. Then they led the young men into the walk-in freezer and tied their necks to some racks. They had to stand on their tiptoes so they wouldn't asphyxiate to death. 
Sidney and Paget then drove away, leaving the young men tied to the racks in the freezer to asphyxiate to death when their legs gave out on them. The off-duty employee thought that the encounter at the restaurant was very strange, so he called his manager. The manager, in turn, called the police. They found Spiroff and Seekham in the freezer. Luckily, they were able to free both men, and neither of them were hurt too badly. Both Sins and Paget were arrested a brief time later. Paget was found guilty of Harrington's murder, and she was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. Sims was convicted of all three murders, and he was sentenced to death in South Carolina and in California. He is currently sitting on death row in California. At his trial for the murders in Hanahan, Sims said, I am not a nice guy. You know it, and I know it. Number 2. Doris Cisneros In the early 1990s, Dora Cisneros was living in an upscale suburb of Brownsville, Texas. She lived with her husband, who was a prominent surgeon, and they had five children. Her favor was her youngest child, Christina. Dora became pregnant with Christina after her eldest son, David, was killed in 1974. He was a senior in high school and he was killed when he was thrown from a vehicle that was driven by his friend. In May 1992, Christina started dating a classmate at her private school, 17-year-old Joey Fisher. They went to prom together, but the relationship only ended up lasting a few weeks before Joey broke it off. Like many teenagers who are dumped, Christina was incredibly upset. In the first few weeks of summer, Dora called Joey several times and asked him why he broke up with Christina. She even offered him $500 a month to date Christina. Joey turned down the offer. Dora also arranged to meet Joey's father, Buddy, and she asked him why Joey had stopped dating Christina. Buddy said it was his son's business and he wanted to stay out of it. Both Buddy and Joey thought that Dora's behavior was unusual, but they thought she was harmless. As the months went on, Joey met another young woman, and he started dating her. Christina also met someone, and they were dating. Even though she was dating someone else, her friends said that they could tell she hadn't gone over Joey. On the morning of March 3rd, 1993, Joey was outside of his family's home washing his car before school. Suddenly, the sound of two gunshots shattered the quiet morning. Joey's mother ran outside and found Joey dead on the driveway. He had been shot in the head and the chest. Sadly, he died at the scene. He was just 18 years old. At first, the police thought that Joey might have been killed because he was either involved in drugs or he was killed because of a case of mistaken identity. Brownsville is on the Mexican border, and violence stemming from the drug trade was not exactly uncommon in the city. The police quickly learned that Joey was a straight-A student, and he was not connected to the drug trade in any way. The police decided to follow up on a piece of evidence that was found at the crime scene. It was a business card for a bail bondsman, and there was some handwriting on it. They went to the bail bondsman and asked to see recent applications. They matched the handwriting on the card to an application filled out by a man who ran a drug smuggling and car theft ring. They interviewed some men that worked for him, and one of those men was Daniel Garza. When the police interviewed him, he admitted that he was involved in the murder. He said that he had been talking to a 72-year-old fortune teller named Maria Martinez. Garza was talking to her because he was looking for ways to win back his estranged wife. Martina said she could help him, but she needed help in exchange. She wanted a young man killed and she would pay $3,000 to whoever did the job. Garza agreed to help and he found two men, Heriberto Pizana and Israel Olivares, to carry out the hit. After admitting to his part in the murder, Garza agreed to wear a wire and meet with Martinez again. 
Martinez was arrested after the meeting, and the police asked her why she wanted to kill a high school honor student. Martinez said that it wasn't her that originally ordered the hit. She said it was another one of her clients, Dora Cisneros, who wanted the young man dead. Dora started getting psychic readings for Martinez after her son died in 1978. After Christina and Joey broke up, Dora asked Martinez to use her tarot cards to see if Christina was destined to marry Joey. Martinez performed a reading and she said that it didn't seem likely that Christina and Joey would ever get back together. Knowing that they'd never be together, Dora wanted revenge on Joey for breaking her daughter's heart. First, Dora asked Martinez to put a deadly curse on him. Martinez said that she couldn't do that. Dora's next plan was to have Joey beat up. But by the winter of 1992, Dora decided she just wanted Joey dead. She asked Martinez if she knew anyone who would kill him for $3,000. She asked Garza to find a hitman, and Garza hired Olivieras and Paisana. After her confession, Martinez agreed to set up a meeting with Dora, and she would wear a wire. She called Dora and said that the killers wanted more money. The police arrested Dora shortly after she paid Martinez $500. Martinez was sentenced to 20 years in prison for her role in the murder, and she served six years. Both Dora and Garza were given life sentences. Dora spent two years in prison, and then her conviction was overturned because of a technicality. She was released from prison, she returned home, and she remained free for three years. She was retried in 1998, this time at the federal level, because calls were made to Mexico, and that's where the hitmen came from, and this made it an international conspiracy. She was again found guilty, and she was again sentenced to life. The gunman and the getaway driver, Pizana and Olivieras, fled to their native Mexico after the murder. They were never arrested for the murder, and their whereabouts are currently unknown, but it's believed that they are somewhere in Mexico. Number 1. Christopher Hightower On the evening of September 22, 1991, Christine Scriabin and her husband, Alex, were throwing a dinner party at their home in Guilford, Connecticut. As dinner was cooking, the doorbell rang. Christine opened the door to find a balding man with glasses who introduced himself as Christopher Hightower and he said he needed to talk to her about something important. She asked him to come back in a few hours after her guest had left. When Hightower returned, Christine led him to her kitchen and over five and a half hours, Hightower told her a bizarre story. He said that he was a commodities broker and Christine's brother, Ernest Brendel, was one of his clients. He then clarified that Ernest just wasn't his client, they were close friends as well. Hightower explained that he had taken some money from the Mafia and lost it in a bad investment. Now the Mafia wanted their money back. Until they got their money, they were going to hold on to Ernest, his wife, Alice, and their eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, along with Hightower's wife and their two sons. Hightower told Christine that they wanted $300,000 and he had $225,000, but he needed the rest from her. Christine thought the story was crazy. Her brother and his family lived in Barrington, which is an upper middle class suburb of Providence, Rhode Island. He was a 48 year old patent lawyer, Alice was a 49 year old librarian at Brown University, and Elizabeth was in the third grade. Christine didn't think it was very likely that they would be connected to the mob in any way. To prove to her that he was telling the truth, Hightower showed her Ernest's driver's license and two rings that belonged to Alice. He then took her outside where the Brendel's car was parked. The back seat and the trunk were covered with a disturbing amount of blood. Hightower said that they couldn't go to the police because the gangsters were watching them and they would kill all six hostages if they did. Unsure what to do, Christine photographed Hightower 
and she said she would get in contact with him. He also gave her one of his credit cards to hold on to as a gesture of his good intentions. After he left, Christine called the FBI. They went to the Brendel's home and found no one there. There were no signs of a break-in and nothing seemed disturbed. Three days later, no one had seen the family, but Hightower was spotted driving their car not far from their home. When he was pulled over, the car was still covered in blood. In the trunk of the car, the police found a crossbow, a kitchen knife, an empty bag of lye, and several human teeth. Hightower was arrested and he was questioned about the whereabouts of the family. He said he didn't know where they were because they were kidnapped by the Mafia. The story that he told to the FBI was very similar to the one that he told Christine, except this time he didn't say that his family was kidnapped. The FBI knew that his wife and sons were fine. His wife had actually just left him, and on the same day that Ernest was last seen alive, she had him served with a restraining order. Six weeks would go by, and no one heard from the family. Then someone happened across their bodies sticking out of a shallow grave in the woods behind the school less than half a mile away from their home. After the discovery of the bodies, the FBI was able to piece together the bizarre and disturbing chain of events. Hightower met Ernest Brendel in 1989 through a mutual friend and they eventually became friends. At the time, Hightower was running his own commodities firm. After Hightower and Ernest became friends, Ernest decided to give him $2,000 to invest. It wasn't long before Hightower lost all the money in one trade. Hightower then showed Ernest an account he was handling that saw a return of over 86%. This was enough evidence to convince Ernest that Hightower knew what he was doing and he gave Hightower another $15,000 to invest. As the months went on, Ernest started to realize that Hightower wasn't as good at trading as he thought he was. It turned out that Ernest was right. Hightower was a terrible broker. The account that Hightower showed him with the high return wasn't real. It was a fake account that Hightower created. On April 1st, 1991, Ernest decided to close his account with Hightower and he wanted to withdraw his money. Out of the original $15,000 investment, only $3,139 remained. Ernest was angry because legally, Hightower was supposed to contact him if the investment dropped to the 50% mark. Ernest wrote two letters and made several phone calls to Hightower, claiming he wanted at least half of his money back. Hightower simply ignored him. In July, Ernest wrote a letter of complaint to the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. In turn, they told Hightower to pay Ernest $11,851 by September 17th or he could lose his brokerage license. Hightower's problem was that he didn't have any money. He lived with his in-laws, he owed his former wife for child support, and his second marriage was falling apart. His wife left him in August and he threatened to have a hitman kill her. This led to her getting the restraining order. On September 19th, two days after he was supposed to pay Ernest back, Highsmith bought a powerful crossbow and six arrows, and he paid with a check. He then went and hid in the Brendel's garage. The next morning, Elizabeth left for school, and then Ernest drove Alice to work. Ernest then returned home and parked his car in the garage. Once he was out of the car, Hightower shot an arrow at him. The arrow went straight through his chest and into the wall behind him. This didn't kill Ernest, so Hightower kept reloading the crossbow and firing arrows at him. He ended up using five arrows, and this still didn't kill Ernest. Hightower picked up a crowbar and bashed him in the head. After killing his former friend and client, Hightower used Ernest's computer to write a letter to the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. He posed as Ernest and he said he was withdrawing his complaint. He then went and dug some graves in the woods behind the school. Afterwards, he went home and before he could change into new clothes, there was a knock at the door. 
who was a process server with a restraining order from his wife. After changing into new clothes, Hightower went to Elizabeth's school to pick her up. The school would release her to him, and they sent her to the nearby YMCA for her after-school program. He tried to pick her up from there, but the staff wouldn't release her into his custody either. Not long afterwards, the YMCA received a call from someone saying they were Ernest Brendel. He said to release Elizabeth to Hightower, and as proof that it was okay, he was going to send his driver's license with Hightower. When Hightower returned to the YMCA with Ernest's driver's license, they let Elizabeth leave with him. Later that evening, Alice got off the bus, and she was surprised to see that her husband and her daughter weren't waiting in the car for her at the bus stop. So she walked home, and when she got inside, she found Hightower there. Ernest was supposed to go to a football game with a friend the next morning, so he kept both mother and daughter alive all night. At 7 a.m., Hightower had Alice call Ernest's friend and tell him that Ernest wouldn't be able to make it to the game because of a family emergency. After the call, both Alice and Elizabeth were drugged. It's believed that Alice was strangled to death with a scarf, and sadly, Elizabeth may have been buried alive. After he buried the family, he cleaned up the garage, and then he went to visit Ernest's sister. He was then arrested three days later. Hightower never confessed to the murders. The FBI think that Hightower's motive was that he wanted revenge on Ernest because he thought that Ernest had ruined his life. If Hightower didn't have his brokerage license, then he didn't have any way to make money, which meant his wife would never come back to him. By killing him and withdrawing the letter of complaint, he'd get revenge and save his livelihood. At his trial, Ernest maintained his innocence despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. This included the fact that he was caught driving the family's blood-soaked car with one of the murder weapons and some of the victim's teeth in the trunk. And there is the check he used to buy the crossbow. His thumbprint was also found on the print key on Ernest's computer. Of course, there was also a clear motive for why Hightower wanted Ernest dead. Amazingly, Hightower chose to testify in his own defense. He said that he had been forced by the Mafia to help them cover up the crime. He also explained that he bought the crossbow because Ernest had asked him to buy it. Ernest was having a problem with the raccoon, and he wanted Hightower to kill it. Hightower said that he was at the family's home the night before Ernest was murdered to hunt the raccoon. He said he killed the raccoon, left its body near the garage, and then went home. A raccoon's body wasn't found on the family's property. Then, much to the shock of the victim's families, he also claimed that Ernest, a hard-working family man, was dealing in heroin. There was absolutely no evidence to back up this claim. Hightower was found guilty, and in 1993 he was given three life sentences. Thanks a lot for watching today's video, hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Thursday and Sunday. If you already do subscribe, thank you so much for doing so. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We may even follow you back. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.